In the process of raising two children, I don't find myself repeating myself as much as I thought I would if you'd asked me BC before children. But I do find myself saying things that I never expected to say. Olivia and I were comparing notes, and I think the most random thing we've had to say is, uh, get the corn dog out of your shoe. And, uh, and the fact you'd even have to repeat yourself. No, seriously, get the corn dog. Thank you. It, uh, <laughs> we, 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 there are moments we have to repeat ourselves. I was hearing about one just before worship. There are things we hear we have to say again and again. And what was that line? What, what were you telling me? How's that working for you? Are you happy feeling that way? My wife was on me too for that. It's allergy season and my wife asked, have you taken anything? She says that a lot. Have you taken anything? And my answer is almost always no. But uh, you, anything you find yourself repeating often? Right, uh, any, you know, any lines you, you say on a regular basis? I'm always intrigued to see what people just find themselves saying all the time. Well, we've, we're here listening to Jesus repeating himself today. He's telling this parable. And he tells it in two different uh, moments, two different Gospels. And we're going to compare the two of them because in as much as uh, they sound very similar, they actually have there's some differences here, and it's interesting. And a lot of it is driven by context. Matthew, first we read Matthew. And as we... As chapter 18 begins of Matthew, we, we sort of, the scene begins, if it was a movie, uh, we, we zoom in and there are the disciples arguing about who is the greatest among them, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Jesus responds to this talk about rank, about who is the best among them, by starting to, be, starting to talk about uh, you need to enter the kingdom like a little child. Right? And, and if you mess with the children, you might as well throw yourself off the edge of a cliff with a millstone around your neck. And, and then Jesus starts talking about how those who are in, uh, those who are in the church, who, those who are in the, the group of people following him, how they respond to division. How do you handle when, when there is conflict and, and challenges and problems? Jesus tells this parable, what do you think then? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, doesn't he leave the 99 and go searching for that one? And I tell you, he rejoices more over it than over the 99 that, went, that never went astray. It is not the will of the Father in heaven that any of these little ones should be lost. The little ones in this context, the sheep that are wandering away, seem to sound like the other people in the church, the people who are arguing about who's, the, who's better or who's worse, and the people that, that the disciples are arguing about, the people who are wandering off, the sheep, are the people who are in the church. Then this seems to be even more clear as we go on, and, and Jesus immediately after this gives instructions about how to handle divisions. If there's a problem in the church, you go, you talk to that person individually, then you take someone in the church with you. And then if that doesn't work, you go bring it to the church and you solve it in-house because this is a church issue by a church member who, who has wandered away, a lost sheep. Right, just, one of the disciples, sensing the theme to this discussion, asks, you know, so Jesus, if we're talking about forgiveness in the church, how often do I need to forgive someone else in the pews with me? And Jesus says, 70 times 7, which is not an invitation to start a tally mark for how many times I need to forgive Andy. Right? This is, no, this is a, a way of life. Right? 77 is the, 7 is the number of completeness, of wholeness. Live a life of complete forgiveness. Right? And then Jesus wraps up this chat about, with his disciples about how things work in the church by telling the story about the king, God, who forgives a servant, who then doesn't forgive another servant, who's also a servant of the king. Right? And so it's, again, an in-house sort of parable. Right? It's how do we forgive each other. And that wraps up this moment, and then Jesus departs, and we've had this tightly knit little discussion where the focus is inwards. Right? Who are the sheep that are wandering off? The sheep who wander off are the ones who are in the church, and now we're the ones who are being taught by Jesus in this context how to fix, how to reconcile, how to forgive, how to do this as a way of life. And so the sheep that wander off in this parable, in this context, are members of the church. And this makes sense in the greater context of the Gospel of Matthew, because Matthew is focused on, it, Matthew is a Jew, focused on Jews, trying to remain Jewish as they follow 
follow Jesus together. All right, Matthew is kind of an insular, turned in words document. All right, Matthew is focused very close to home because he's trying to keep a church together that is struggling to follow Jesus together, but isn't always doing a great job of it. Right? That's how the Gospel of Matthew, every Gospel is written for the point of bringing people to following Jesus, but all of them have their slants and their focuses. Right? And this is Matthew's, sort of an in-house focus. Luke approaches this very differently. Luke tells the very same story, but in different contexts. Jesus rolls into town, and people are gathering because they're fascinated with him. Right? And, and Jesus rolls into town, and the Pharisees are paying attention because when the traveling preacher comes to town, the other preachers want to find out. And, and, and so uh, Jesus rolls into town, and, and people are coming, and, and they're attracted to him. And he invites people out to have dinner with them. And they're sinners, it tells us. And not just any type of sinners, they're tax collectors. And tax collectors are state-endorsed extortion artists. Because the way it works, let's say that the city of Milan has $100,000 worth of, uh, of local tax that it's owed. Does anyone know exactly how much tax we all pay locally? Okay, $100,000 just round figure for the sake of it, right? And, and if I went to the city and I outbid everyone else for the right to collect taxes under the system, I would owe the city $100,000 and everything else I could get out of you, I could keep. Right? And so I, what would happen is you'd, you'd hire muscle, and you'd go to people, and you'd try to beat it out of them. Right? And so if I could get more money out of you and your mama and your children and your family, then i just put it in my pocket. Right? I can't think of a single job that we have today that is more despised than tax collectors. Then. Can you all think of anything that is more despised? Right? I can't think of anyone. Right? So for Jesus to eat with tax collectors... That's, that's something, right? That is impressive. He is eating with people who have hurt people in the community. And so the Pharisees see this and they're grumbling. You know how the, that grumbling sounds like, this ain't proper. This is not what a good preacher should do. All those people following Jesus, they're wasting their life. Grumble, grumble, grumble. You know how you start hearing that grumble in the back of the coffee shop and not proper. Right? This is what they're doing. And so as Jesus rolls out of having dinner, with some of these folks, the Pharisees are kind of grumbling under their breath at him, you know, looking at him over their coffee mugs, and, uh, and he responds. And he looks at him and he says, let me tell you a story. Right? Which one of you, you Pharisees, right? which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for the sheep that was lost is found. And just, as I just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine who need no repentance. This is kind of a parable with an edge to it. right? Which one of you, you Pharisees, you're the shepherds here. Why aren't you out chasing the sheep? These are sheep, they've gone far afield. Right? I'm here for the sheep. Why did the tax collectors have to wait for me to show up to town before someone in the church paid attention to them? Right? Pharisees, why aren't you rejoicing that I'm bringing them home? I'm bringing them home. And you're out here grumbling. It's a parable with an edge to it. Right? Why aren't you rejoicing? Jesus keeps on going and tells the parable of the woman who loses the coin and goes seeks to find it. And the parable of the father and the two sons. And the one son, usually called the prodigal son, though there's not much prodigal about him, he really whiffs. Right? He declares his father's dead, takes the inheritance, goes to a far land. How far away does this sheep wander? He goes far away. He goes to another country. And he burns the family money Right? And then he, he comes home. And that, that's also a parable with an edge to it because you t he's still talking to those Pharisees and, and the elder son is not exactly happy to see the younger son show up. And who do you think the older son is being compared to here? Right? In the same way that the Gospel of Matthew had a focus sort of turned inwards, how do we keep ourselves together? Right? That is the same type of thing that we see in Luke. Luke has a different focus. The focus for Luke... It is um, following Jesus. Jesus, everything kind of turns inwards for a minute as they follow Jesus to Jerusalem in Luke. But then Luke, the next chapter of Luke is Acts. 
Right, you read the introduction to Luke and the introduction to Act, it's the same introduction. My beloved Theophilus, my beloved, uh, my, the person who loves God, Theo, God, Phyllis, love. So but the person who loves God, let me tell you a story about Jesus who goes to Jerusalem, and then in the book of Acts, the news of Jesus spreads from Jerusalem to Judea to all the world. Right? The book of Acts, the book of Luke and the book of Acts have a different agenda because it's not focused inwards on how can we hold these people together. The book of Luke and Acts is all about how can we get the word of Jesus out there to go as far out as we can possibly go to cover the whole entire known world. And so who are, who are the sheep in this parable then? Same parable, but which sheep are wandering? Is it the people who were in the church and have left? Or is it the people more like those tax collectors who have never been in the church? The people have wandered far from the place they began. Right? Luke is chasing down sheep. Right? That's how Jesus, he's talking about though. That's what he's focusing on, chasing down sheep that have never darkened the door of a church, and Luke is out looking for them. It's the same story. It's the same parable. Right? It's the same sort of context, the same idea that in the kingdom of God we pay attention to those who are lost, either having, as Matthew sort of shapes it, that, uh, the, the, that those who are lost because they've left the church, or as Luke sort of presents it, lost because they've never been part of the church. Either way, the parable here is, is focusing us on searching after a lost sheep. And how much is a lost sheep worth? Well, for a shepherd, it's worth one month's salary. If you lost one month's salary, how hard would you look to find it? Right? If I lost one month's salary, I'd be lighting up the phone to, Mary, help, where's my... Yeah, you lose a month's salary, it gets your attention. Right? This is how hard these shepherds are looking. And if a sheep is worth that much, a shepherd, a person is worth so much more. Now, there is one part of this we probably should not be emphasizing, that uh, you could read this and say, you know, I'm not the shepherd. My role is to rejoice when the shepherd does his job um, and, and start saying, you know what, Andy, pastor, shepherd, you go searching. Uh, if you read this with the other parts of, of this, it makes it very clear that we're all part of the search committee, right? Jesus doesn't say, y'all, pastor, you go reconcile everyone. People in the pews, don't, don't worry about it. Like, everyone gets involved in this. So this, that's part of the parable we don't want to push too far. The, the important part of the parable is the focus on, on getting outwards and focused outwards and finding sheep. Now, why is it that Jesus repeats himself? Right? Why is it that Jesus is repeating himself? It, 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 what's actually happening here? Is it that Jesus told the story once and Matthew and Luke are, are misremembering it? Eh, I doubt it. Right? We all repeat ourselves. Jesus repeated himself. Did, did Jesus repeat himself and, and he, he meant the same thing every time? Uh, maybe. But I think it's far more likely is, is that what G, the parable Jesus is telling here is, is the right answer to a lot of different problems. There's a band director over at Truman, great band director, named Dan Peterson. And there are hundreds of band directors all around the state who want to grow up and be just like Dan, or Pete as he's called. And uh, his solution to every problem is 10% more air. Brass, I need a little bit more phrasing. I need a longer phrase there. Could you give me 10% more air? Right? Trumpets, you're a little bit out of tune on those high notes. Could you give me 10% more air? Clarinets, that's just a little bit. Could you give me 10% more air? Every time I remember him answering a question, the year I played under his instruction, his, under his direction, that, that was the answer. I What's the... 10% more. It's actually a pretty good answer to anyone playing any wind instrument. It solves all problems. 10% more air. It really does. It makes you sound a lot smarter than you are. You watch a band cry. They don't sound 10% more air. That'd help them. Right? It, it got to the point listening to him talk about this. I thought, you know, if I would go ask him about my car, my car's not running rough, he'd want to ask, is your gas to air? 10% more air, your car will run better. He oh, has his answer to everything. Right? And I think doctors do the same thing. Dr. Esmeyer, how many times have you told someone, more exercise, better diet? Right? How many times have you heard that? More exercise, better diet. It solves all problems, right? Doesn't it? Right? More exercise, better diet. That's what Jesus is doing here, right? If you want to ask, if you're turning into Jesus, you know, Jesus, I'm worried about the health of the church. I'm worried about the health of the congregation. Have you looked for your lost sheep? 
Right? I'm worried about how the church it views itself, how the church is engaged with the outside world. Well, have you gone looking for any sheep recently? Right? Are you I'm wondering what we should be focused on as a church? Well, have you thought about the lost sheep? Right? I think that's kind of how it starts to get after a while talking to Jesus. Have you looked for some sheep recently? Right? That's the answer he's given because it's always right. right? Jesus is repeating himself. And Jesus has to repeat himself because it's not human nature to give 10% more air, to eat better and get more exercise, or to focus on the person who's not in the room. Who's the easiest person to ignore at a meeting? The person didn't show up, right? And so for Jesus to say, pay attention to the lost sheep, is to focus us outwards. Because if the, whether the sheep is lost because they left the church, it's got awkward, it got weird, something happened, we'd rather not talk about it. Or if they've never been in the church, you know, we just, you know, let's, just let's, well, let's talk about next Sunday. Right? It is easy to ignore the person who is not there. And Jesus keeps on telling this story again and again and again. Go find some sheep. Right? Go listen to them. Go talk to them. Go find them. Go hug on them. Carry them back if you have to. Right? Focus on sheep. Now, this is not to say Jesus says ignore the 99. That's a different sermon. Jesus spends plenty of time with his disciples. But he doesn't want us to ever forget there are sheep out there, and if you are a sheep who is lost, the most important thing you need is to be found. Right? I don't know what it looks like to be, become a church that searches for lost sheep. Right? Maybe go to our ministry meeting report, old business, new business, lost sheep time. I, I don't know. I mean, lost, do we need the lost sheep report? I, I know it has to be more than a committee. We don't, a lost sheep committee kind of misses the point because it has to become part of, it, it's meant to be part of how all of us work. Jesus never looked at, at the 12 disciples and said, now you, the, you three, you pay attention. The rest of you can check out now, right? Jesus was always talking to all of them. And so I would suggest maybe the one thing we can do to see lost sheep is to first look around. Right, you know who sits where and what pews. Right? You, you all know. Who sits, who do you miss today? Who might usually be here that now is not? Who used to be here, who once was, and is still in here in the area, right? Who do you miss? Can you call them this week? Ask them. We missed you. We missed you. And, 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 you're, and, and what's the worst that happens? Someone gets four or five calls. What do you tell them? Well, Jesus put us up to it. All right? Looking for lost sheep. Not, it's not just names of people who have left this church. It's names of people who have never been in this church. There are people we have been praying for who have never been part of a church, and to continue to pray for them and to invite them and to involve them. Next Sunday, we're going to, it's an odd thing. Next Sunday, we're going to have barbecue and s'mores after worship. It's one of the few times a year I'll go up to guys and say, can you come to church so that you can skip the sermon and cook? But you know what that is? One step closer to being in church, right? And so... Invite people, bring people, because there are lost sheep, and Jesus sends us to look, look for them. What I find deeply reassuring is that if one day I am a lost sheep, I find it reassuring that hopefully one of you will come to find me as well. For we all might wander, and Jesus wants all.